All right, thank you very much. It is so great to be here. I, um, I think I told you last time I was at the SEEK conference, if you were there, that I'm an ENFP in the Myers-Briggs. You all know what the Myers-Briggs is, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you know what an ENFP is, the prayer of the ENFP goes like this, dear Lord, help me to focus more on the things, oh look, a bird, on the things I need to remember. I, am, I have a hard time staying focused, and there's a lot of distractions here, which is wonderful, but I only have 15 minutes to do this talk, which is a lot less than normal for me. And so, so trying to avoid distractions is going to be a real problem. Now, um, I should also say that I've never done this talk before. I was writing part of it this morning. I saw many of you last night pretty late, and you were like, oh, good luck on that talk. And I said, yeah, say a prayer because I haven't finished it yet. So I'm still, I was still trying to think about it. So I'm going to try to my best to avoid distractions. Um, and so last night, and, and by the way, the people at Focus left it up to me what to talk about, which is a bad idea for an ENFP because we'll wait till the last minute. You know, like, I bet another idea will come up. So last night I came and I listened to Curtis Martin talk. Was that a wonderful talk? It was amazing. <laughs> And it kind of ticked me off because I was like, well, he just talked about the most important stuff. You know, basically, it's like his talk was how to get to heaven, and mine is like, teach him how to bake a cake. I mean, how important can this possibly be? Because that was like, well, he covered everything right there. It was incredible. So I thought, so how can I make this important? So after his talk, I went in the back of the room during the Matt Maher concert. I should tell you, I know Matt Maher is a friend of mine, and I hate that guy. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because, <laughs> because my son, who's 11 now, a year ago, he loves Matt Maher. And they did, he had to do a poster in his class that introduced everybody to him. And so he had to put pictures of him and his family and talk about his favorite football team and his favorite food and his favorite musician, Matt Marr. Right? Awesome. His favorite person, you know who got second? Me, to Matt Marr. <laughs> I hate Matt Marr. <laughs> but what, so I'm sitting in the back listening to my favorite music, and I just got down on my knees back there, and I said, God, Please show me what you want me to teach these people about leadership tomorrow. Let me just, let me say something to them that's meaningful for them. And if you could make it funny, that would be awesome. Because, I, you know, the darker part of me likes to be funny. And so, so, and I started to think about is what, what would I want to tell you guys in a short period of time about leadership that could make a difference in your life? And, and two things I think God put on my heart. First, don't believe what the world tells you leadership is. This is something I want to convey to you. Do not believe what the world... See, the world tells you what leadership is. The best way to understand it is to think about graduation speeches. Many of you have been to a graduation speech for yourself lately, whether you're after college now and you're a missionary, or if you're still in college, you did a high school one. And what do they say? Go out and be a leader. Everybody, go be... You're the future leaders of America and of the world. Be a leader, which is crazy. Because they, they, they make it sound easy, and like everybody is supposed to be a leader, and not everybody is supposed to be a leader. Because you have to really understand what leadership is. And you know that people don't understand, because you ask most young people, what do you want to do? They say, well, I just want to change the world. I just want to make a difference. And they go, that's great. What kind of difference do you want to make in the world, and how do you want to change it? Oh, I don't know yet, but when I figure it out, I really want to do that. And you think, well, actually, that might not be such a good thing. And if you go scratch a little under the surface, what you realize is people that say, I want to change the world and make a difference and be a leader, but they don't know how or why, what they're really saying is, I want to be important, and I want to be known. And after a while, if you scratch a little further, it's like, I kind of like to be rich and famous and powerful. And that becomes the standard, very common, and very dangerous definition of what leadership is in the world, and that's what the secular world will tell you. Be a leader, be important, be famous, be known. Hey, and infamy is just as good as fame these days, right? So just be famous, and that's what makes you a leader. And so anybody who's famous, if be they a politician, or a celebrity, or an athlete, or a musician, as long as they're famous, we, society kind of calls them a leader. Of course, that can't be so for us. As Jesus said, you know, in, in the secular world, he essentially said that people lord their power over one another if they're leaders, and that's not true for us as followers of Christ. And so you have to remember that leadership for you is going to be very different. In fact, we know that being a follower of Christ today is countercultural, and it gets more countercultural, it seems, every day, doesn't it? To be a follower of Christ really is to be radical. I don't know if any of you have read that book called Killing Jesus. Anybody read that book yet? I, I 
put it off for a long time because it's a, I thought it was a secular book that was going to just present a historical Jesus and it wasn't going to be about faith. I found it fascinating because it explained the historical realities of Jesus in the world during that time. And later on, the authors, who both really happen to be Catholic, as it turns out, both at one point said, so kind of you have to look at it and say Jesus was either a lunatic or a liar or the son of God, right? So it's a, it's a great book that's actually, I think, evangelizing a lot of people out there who are reading it because it's a history book. But one of the things I realized, and I know you already know this, but when I read it, I realized it even more, is that Jesus was a radical. In a kind, sweet way, he was a radical. Not always sweet, but I mean, tough. And so we are called to be radicals. Well, that means as leaders, if being a follower of Christ means we're countercultural, then being a leader as a follower of Christ means we're going to have to be countercultural. And we're going to have to reject this notion that leadership is about becoming important and famous and powerful and wealthy. Okay? Well, what does that mean? Well, leadership actually, leadership actually is about humility and suffering. <laughs> How about that? Can you imagine? So everybody, good, congratulations on graduating from college. Now go out there and suffer. You know? <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you're ready for that. That's good. Do you guys know who Justin Fatika is? He's this guy that's hard as nails ministry. He always says, are you ready to be rejected? He's this muscle guy that teaches about Jesus. Because if you're not ready to be rejected, Jesus was rejected. That's his whole thing, you know. It's like, yes. <laughs> you know, if the world, if the world told people that that leadership was really about humility and suffering. I think that song, you know, Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys, would be don't let your babies grow up to be leaders. Because who wants their kids to grow up to be leaders if they're going to have to suffer and be humble? But that's what we're called to do. Now, and if you look at it, so we're followers of Christ, and I've, sometimes I get a little uncomfortable when people say, the greatest leadership role model of all time was Jesus. I mean, that's so obvious, but he was God's son, and I don't like to relegate him to just, you know, he was probably the best tennis player. If he played play tennis, then he could probably be great at that too. <laughs> But the, the point is, I mean, he's the, he's the role model for everything, right? So, but when people say he's the best leadership role model, because look what he did, okay, we'll take that. And where did that lead him? To the cross. Now, that's not the secular idea of what leadership does for us, right? But let's take Jesus off that, because he's God's son, and God incarnate. Okay, let's go Peter. Oh, yeah, upside down cross. Well, Paul, well, he was killed too. Well, let's go forward in history. St. Joan of Arc, what a great female. Oh, yeah, she was burned at the stake, right? Right. Okay, let's go to American history. Well, Lincoln. Oh, yeah, they hated him, and eventually he was killed. Okay, but let's go more into the church, John Paul II. Now, people will say, well, people love John Paul II. He's going to be a saint. Isn't that great? You remember, well, you guys are too young. The world, a lot of the world hated this guy. <laughs> Now, after he died, they were like, he was the greatest. It was like, they were all, oh, he suffered immensely for truth and was a great leader. And then he said, what about Pope Francis? Everybody loves him. And Pope Francis knows that that will change. I mean, we will love him. But the world, he's not being the way he is to win the popularity of the world. He is popular right now, but as soon as, you know, he's in his first year in his papacy, and I remember when John Paul II was too, over time, as he is called upon to, to, to preach the truth again and again and again, people will not like what he has to say, and he will suffer for that too. And he knows that. He's suffered throughout his life. See, being leaders is not about doing things for yourself. It's about actually taking on the suffering for others. And you know what else it is? It's about loving those people you're suffering for. And again, I'm not telling you, I'm preaching to the choir here, folks. But even as leaders in the world, you're going to realize I'm at my best as a leader when I'm suffering for the people I lead even the ones that don't like me. And those people on campus, I loved Matt Marr's comment in his con concert last night about when people tweet about you negative things on campus. You're leading those people that are doing that tweeting about you. You're loving them, and that's what leadership is. It's lonely, it's suffering, it's misery, and it's pure joy. Because it's what we're called to do. Humility and suffering leads to joy. Now, I know this because I tried the other one. See, I thought leadership was about being important and, well, and popular. And for much of my early career, that's what I tried to do. I wanted to be a famous author and, and say things that were smart and give a talk and make people like me. And there's nothing wrong with that if I don't, if, as long as I don't really want it. But you know what trying to be important and popular leads to? Misery. I promise you this because I've done it. <laughs> 
And I can tell you that the great the athletes I've met that have come to faith and the, and the celebrities I've met that have come to faith have all said they went down that path and they got up against the wall and they just said, is this all there is? Let me tell you a story. Tom Brady was on 60 Minutes. I just saw this clip the other day. And um, it was from a few years ago. And, you know, Tom Brady, the quarterback of the uh, Patriots. And he, um, yeah, woo, yeah. ENFPs out there, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tom Brady was on 60 Minutes, and they said, wow, you're, you're, this was a few years ago, you're like 30 years old, and you've, you've, you've got a, signed a $60 million contract, you know, you date a supermodel, you've won three Super Bowls, I mean, you, this is amazing what you've done. And he goes, yeah, you know, I think people would probably be surprised, I mean, your, your viewers are probably going to be surprised when I tell you, though, I, I got to tell you, I, I wait, wake up every day, every day, and I think, is this it? There has to be something more. And then the guy said, well, what do you think you're missing? And you know what he said? I don't know. Well, of course, we know what he's missing. Hopefully, he's not missing it anymore. That was a few years ago. The point of the matter is, if you're a leader and you want to lead people and you want to be important and you want to be well-liked, you are destined for misery. And if you're a leader and you want to be humble and you want to suffer for others, you're destined for great joy. That joy won't manifest itself the way the rest of the world thinks joy will. The cross, the stake, the upside down cross, the, twi- the Twitters, the tweets. I don't know. I'm not, I don't do that. I'm sorry. My kids would be laughing at me right now. But the point is this. You are going to suffer and prepare yourself for that because when you do, you know you're leading. Now, that, that sounds negative, but it's not. It's a beautiful thing because that's when you know you're doing the work of God. Now, here's the second thing I want you to know, and this is so important for me to tell you. Do not let people tell you that you're preparing to be leaders right now. Don't let them tell you that someday you'll be a leader, and this stuff you're doing at Focus is a good preparation for that. You are leaders now. But you know who my heroes are in the world? You know who I want my children to grow up to become? You. Not the CEOs that I work with. You. You. I come to this conference, and I move to tears. I go to conferences all the time with the world's most important leaders. I'm not moved to tears. I want my children to be like you. I want to be like you. You are already the leaders that God wants you to be. And you have more to come. But don't think that this training you're doing now is going to prepare you someday to be the executive vice president of accounting at a widget company. And that's when you're really going to put your leadership skills to use. You are leading at the pinnacle of leadership right now. Because you are changing people's lives through humility and suffering. And you're changing them in ways that most CEOs I work with have impact no one. So just know that this isn't training for someday doing something important. You guys are doing what's important right now. Right now. Everybody wants to think of their future. What are you going to be someday? And if somebody comes up to Steve, the the guy up here, and says, here's what the secular world would say. You know, he should be a, a talk show host or a game show host. Wouldn't he be great? That would be a waste. He should do what he's doing now. Because he's changing people's lives. That's leadership. That's leadership. And I can tell you this, my friends, my friends who are embedded in the secular world would look at Curtis Martin and what Focus has done, and you know what they would say? Wow, he could be a great CEO of a company. It's like, he is. (laughs) And this company actually is changing the world. So let me tell you something, you guys. You might not realize this, but you've hit the leadership jackpot by being here. If I could get my kids into Harvard or set them up to run a company someday or or know today that they were going to be focused missionaries, I'd take the third one. And so don't lose sight of where you are. And someday you may be the executive vice president of a widget company, but you're going to be leading your parishes, you're going to be leading your families, and you're going to be doing this missionary work you're doing right now every day at work. So let's remember, you're already leaders, and don't let the secular world redefine it for you. Now, here's my my TED Talk moment uh, crystallizing this for you, something I've learned in in the last three months of my life. I've learned that if you combine two things, you can accomplish anything in life. If you can do two things, if you can avoid fear and you can avoid pride, God opens doors for you constantly. The beauty of that, you can't fake it. And if you're ultimately serving yourself, you can't overcome pride. 
But when you set your pride aside, when you decide, I don't care if I get credit for this, I don't care if anybody ever knows I did this, I really don't care, God knows that's enough for me, I really don't need anything from this other than to do a good job. And I don't care if I get criticized or if I fail or if I look stupid. If you set aside fear and pride in your life, God will open doors for you to accomplish the most amazing things for him. It's taken me 48 years to learn this. Maybe for you, you can learn it when you're 18 or 19 or 22 or 26 or 28. I hope you can because I want you to keep doing what you're doing because you truly are the best hope for leadership in our world. The people sitting in this room, and I thank you for being humble and for suffering and for, I'm, I, I want to say to you, I'm so excited for the joy you're already experiencing and what you will experience in the world. God bless you and thank you for what you're doing.